wherever you may hail i'm your host john bruni welcome to the focus where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world each episode we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time from international relations and global economics to philosophy and science no topic is off limits Join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community. Today, we'll be speaking about North Korea. This week, there's been a lot of media coverage about the Putin-Kim summit in Russia, with many speculating that a major arms deal will be struck between Moscow and Pyongyang. For a small, poor and otherwise insignificant country, the Kim dynasty has managed to successfully put North Korea front and center of international relations and strategic concerns in Northeast Asia. And despite American strategic strength, Washington has never truly been able to deter this rogue country from rattling the cage of the international community. Joining us for this discussion is Lauren Sukin. Lauren is Assistant Professor of International Relations and a Centre Affiliate at the London School of Economics Felon US Centre. But before we start, a shameless plug for ourselves. Please subscribe to our channel. We need the algorithm to find us and by hitting the subscribe and like buttons, this is your contribution to the growth of what hopefully will become a South Australian global sensation. Lauren. Thank you for joining us on The Focus. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. In your recent published article in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, Bigger Isn't Always Better, Why the United States Fails to Deter North Korea Despite Nuclear Superiority, you discuss North Korea's recent Victory Day parade, which showcased its advanced missiles. What message is North Korea trying to convey with these displays of military technology? So this is part of a pretty typical strategy for North Korea, where they'll roll out new technology in a very visible way. And that's both to communicate to a domestic audience, where the regime is trying to really shore up support and show their strength. But it's also about trying to communicate internationally. And this parade was rare and notable because it had representatives from both Russia and China there, something that the regime hasn't had in a couple of years, in part because of the COVID-19 crisis, which really rocked North Korea quite hard. So North Korea in this Victory Day Parade, which celebrates the conclusion of the 1950-1953 Korean War, brought out um, along with a large number of soldiers and more conventional equipment, a series of large missiles. And these really powerful um, missiles are able to carry nuclear warheads. And importantly, they can reach anywhere in the continental United States. And so this technology has really changed how North Korea um, how North Korea's nuclear capabilities will work and will influence politics. Despite North Korea's small nuclear arsenal compared to that of the United States, it continues to test its ballistic missiles. Could you explain to our audience why the US has been unable to deter North Korea from these tests? Absolutely. So North Korea tests its technology for a couple of reasons. One is that it's an iterative scientific process. Um, However, most countries don't engage in the type of testing that North Korea does or on the scale that North Korea does it. So North Korea's testing is also something we can really interpret as signaling, telling the world, back off, we have these weapons, if you threaten us or you do things that we don't like, then we have these quite dangerous capabilities. North Korea has changed its attitude about testing over the years. In the past uh, year, North Korea has tested a very large number of missiles, more than it ever has in, in a previous single year. So these capabilities are really important to North Korea, and the testing has been 
a clear centerpiece of Kim Jong-un's policy in, um, in recent times. So the United States and South Korea, of course, don't want these tests to happen. The tests are um, demonstrations of North Korean investment in its dangerous nuclear arsenal. And you might think, you know, North Korea is far less powerful than the United States. And so it should be able to, um, or it should maybe acquiesce to US demands. But that's not what we see. The US doesn't have very much leverage with North Korea and has really struggled to get this testing down. And there are really two main reasons for that. One is that the US is not particularly integral to North Korea's economy. North Korea suffers from vast sanctions from the United States and from many countries around the world. But North Korea, in response to that, has become very inwardly driven and engages in some elements of sanctions evasion through things like black markets, um, but also relies really heavily on China, to some degree Russia, as well as some foreign aid, and most of that foreign aid is coming from South Korea and from China. So the U.S. can impose more sanctions on North Korea, but at this point, there's very little economic effect that those sanctions can have that would really change the equation in North Korea. Now, that's the economic side of the story, but the other side of the story is a military one. When we think about how influence happens, especially with nuclear weapons, we think about two different elements, resolve and capabilities. Capabilities is basically, what do you have? How big is it? And how much damage can it cause? But that's not enough. You also have to have resolve or the perception that you're actually going to use those capabilities. Yeah, let me just uh, play devil's advocate here and say that perhaps one of the other things that doesn't get a lot of traction in terms of analyzing North Korea, you're right in terms of the US doesn't have a lot of economic leverage over North Korea. So therefore, there's no rug to pull out from under Pyongyang. But obviously, there is also the deliberate policy objectives of the Kim regime that effectively has turned North Korea into an autarkic state. You know, they they do get by on little handouts from neighboring countries from time to time, but effectively, they look after themselves in spite of the fact that it comes at great cost to the North Korean people. So would you also say that North Korean autarkic policies have protected the Kim regime in a way that if they were more open to the world in terms of trade, they would they just wouldn't have those options. One of the benefits of economic openness and globalization is that it allows peace, both through making the costs of conflict a lot higher, but also because we can use these negative levers like sanctions to punish states that violate international norms and international laws. Those levers don't exist so much in the North Korean context anymore, because as you say, North Korea has really focused on building up sustainable or pseudo-sustainable uh, domestic economic capabilities. Now, that's not to say that Pyongyang is thriving, but that they often will intentionally um, turn away from outside help. For example, several states offered aid to North Korea during the COVID-19 crisis, and the regime insisted not only that it did not have any cases of COVID, but that it didn't need aid and wouldn't engage with other countries on this issue. So North Korea wants economic aid to some degree and does want some amount of economic engagement with other countries, particularly countries that have used more favorably like China and Russia. But at the same time, it's very important for the regime to be able to stand on its own. And often the costs of that have come at the expense of the population um, at some of the worst points in the uh, latest pandemic. The regime was even putting out messages saying things like it's now OK to kill and eat black swans, which have a very symbolic um, and meaningful presence in, in North Korea. So there are people who are starving, who do not have um, the sort of subsistence ca capabilities that we would want a nation to have. But North Korea is much more concerned about managing the persistence of the regime than it is about the economic strength of the country or about making sure that its population is uh, well-fed, well-supplied, and happy. Uh, in terms of the sanctions, though, 
uh, how how much further could the United States, should it ever want to, push the North Koreans? I would imagine that by now, most of the key operators within Pyongyang have been individually targeted, and the nation has been collectively targeted. How far can they push the sanctions? Have they not already exhausted that basket? So we've been talking about sanctions in terms of their economic effects, but sanctions do also have symbolic effects. So there are reasons to continue the program of sanctions. If North Korea takes adverse actions and the United States does not respond, it gives them permission to continue with their program of aggressiveness. So sanctions, even sanctions that are relatively marginal, that we wouldn't expect to have a big economic effect, can still be meaningful. But of course, there's a trade-off with sanctions. Some sanctions have real concrete utility there, for example, preventing North Korea from selling or buying arms. But other sanctions are largely symbolic, where they focus on luxury goods that would only be available to a small few anyhow. And those sanctions still matter, but they're not going to um, influence politics in quite the same way as broader reaching sanctions might be able to do. Now, the other issue with sanctions is you can get to a point where the things that are left to be sanctioned are goods that could potentially be really important to the survival um, or health and happiness of a general population. So you want to be very careful, for example, about implementing sanctions on basic food goods, even though sanctions on maybe a very luxury food product would target a different audience and might have some purpose. Lauren, could you discuss the roles of Russia and China in relation to North Korea's actions? How have these neighboring allies contributed to North Korea's defiance of U.S. demands? Russia and China in the past have cooperated with the United States on... Um, in the past, they've cooperated with the United States in order to curb some of North Korea's aggressive activities. Now, the the downside of that, of course, is that uh, now that there's less interest in China and North Korea in that behavior, there are fewer opportunities for cooperation among those three nations. And in the meantime, Russia and China look like they've been warming up to North Korea. Uh, Russia has reopened train travel between the two countries. There's been some cooperation um, economically. There have been accusations that North Korea is selling artillery or other capabilities to mm -hmm. Russia, although both countries have denied that involvement. And China has always had stronger economic relationships with North Korea, um, as there's some trade across the border between the two countries. And China, who's invested in the stability of the North Korean regime, has also provided economic aid to Pyongyang. In your article, you suggest that the U.S. struggles to deter Nor North Korea despite its nuclear superiority um, can you explain this paradox and the findings from your research on this topic? Because it does sound rather counterintuitive. You kind of think that the big guy in the room carrying the big stick is going to be able to have their way. Absolutely. But empirically, what we see is that having the big stick isn't always what's going to get you your way. Now, the problem is that North Korea can impose very significant costs on the United States and its allies if a conflict escalates. So even though the U.S. could maybe win a nuclear war against North Korea, we have to ask, at what cost? Yeah. That allows North Korea, even with a relatively small nuclear arsenal, to have very significant power in its relationships in the region, including in these adversarial relationships. Crises often come down to who cares the most, who has the most at stake. For North Korea, every crisis is a crisis of survival. Although the U.S. policy towards North Korea isn't formally a policy of regime change, rhetoric about the importance of getting rid of the Kim regime has been central in U.S. policy for quite a long time, and the regime certainly interprets U.S. behavior as part and parcel of a broader package of policies designed to remove power from the regime. So what to the U.S. and its allies might look like a relatively minor crisis can in North Korea be a question of whether or not the regime will be able to survive. And this is part of why we see them constantly demonstrate their resolve to push forward if any crisis did occur or escalate. You know, Lauren, there's been uh, a belief that the Kim dynasty could not reach a formal accord with the United States 
because of the nature of U.S. politics as opposed to the nature of politics in places like China and Russia. In China and Russia, there's a consistent and continuous policy that goes for decades. <laughs> it's this notion of dictatorships are good at long-term planning. I mean, I think that that's a debatable point, but still it's a point that has been uh, floated before in the public domain. Um, do you buy into this or do you think that, you know, it really doesn't matter, you know, the political system, uh, North Korea ought to be somehow brought into the fold. It ought to be contained from its most egregious uh, foreign policy missteps or maybe steps if you want to be more generous toward Pyongyang. Uh, how do you see things? As an argument. So some scholars have made this argument that it's much more difficult for democratic states to engage in long-term or complicated foreign policy because of this fluctuation in leadership and sometimes fluctuation in policy goals. I think in general that doesn't pan out, in part because we do see pretty significant consistency in democratic foreign policy. Yes, you do have a leader and variation in party, but often there are clear continuous threads across different uh, presidential administrations or prime ministerships that try to advance the goals of the state more broadly. We've seen relative consistency in, for example, the U.S. policy towards North Korea. The policy has long been about denuclearization, about using sanctions, as well as economic aid to try to engage with the North Korean regime. And on Pyongyang's side, we've seen relative willingness to embrace that exchange. Now, North Korea hasn't been willing to give up its nuclear arsenal, and not a lot of progress has been made. But often, North Korea has been willing to come to the table with different U.S. leaders. I don't necessarily think that there's a rejection of that democratic process. But we certainly see major differences between the countries and their outlook to the world. The U.S. has framed the crisis with North Korea as an issue of democracy versus autocracy, and to some degree that's right. There are huge costs to letting an autocratic regime that's violent, that oppresses its own people, maintain uh, the kind of control and influence in the world that North Korea does. Those fundamental differences in values and outlook will make it very hard to find any points of compromise. That's not necessarily about the system of government or changes in foreign policy over time, but it does represent a, a larger issue that the two countries will really struggle to work through as they move forward. Lauren, in your article, you suggest that the U.S. struggles to deter North Korea, not despite its nuclear superiority, but because of it. Can you explain this paradox to our audience, please? So when states get into crises with each other, we have a literature that thinks about essentially who's going to back down first. And one of the arguments that's been present for a long time suggests that it's basically about whoever is more powerful. Now, empirically, at least in the context of the United States and North Korea, that doesn't seem to work. The U.S. has much more sophisticated military capabilities, but also is not winning when it gets into crises with North Korea. Instead, North Korea can continue acting very aggressively. And I argue that this is something that's endogenous to capabilities. When the U.S. makes a threat against North Korea, even if from the outside, that threat looks like it's economic or it's military, but relatively minor. What North Korea is seeing is often a threat to regime change. The U.S. policy, of course, isn't formally a policy of regime change, but comments of regime change have been present in U.S. foreign policy towards North Korea for quite a long time. If the U.S. agreed, for example, that it wasn't going to pursue a re regime change goal, but then North Korea gave up any amount of its military capabilities, especially if those were nuclear. What happens in the next stage? The U.S. always then has the ability to go in and use the weakened North Korean situation to try to impose regime change or major political change on the Korean peninsula. So for the North Korean regime, every crisis is an existential crisis. If it backs down even a little bit, it creates these opportunities potentially for its much more powerful adversary to come in and really mess up its political goals. Now, that means that North Korea is able to show when these crises occur that it's very, very committed to remaining steady because it just doesn't have another choice. Now, the other element here is about North Korea actually having the ability to follow through on that resolve. 
because North Korea has nuclear capabilities, if it's very committed to holding the line, it also can threaten the United States with consequences that are really untenable for the United States, whether that's a nuclear attack in uh, the Indo-Pacific or with North Korea's new capabilities of targeting the United States, the U.S. would not be willing to or should not be willing to tolerate a nuclear exchange with North Korea. Um, and yet, at the same time, the United States has this puzzle of having to communicate that it is, in fact, willing to fight a nuclear war. And that sort of tension between the really intense consequences of nuclear engagement and the necessity of credibility for deterrence comes to a head in these situations. Essentially, what it boils down to is that North Korea can show more resolve in these crises, and it has the power to back that up, even yeah. if that eventual nuclear war at the end of the line might look better for the United States, it would be devastating for everyone. And that gives North Korea enough power to be able to get its way in international politics. Interestingly enough, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the whole Libyan disarmament process back in 2003. Can you explain how that affected North Korean thinking with regard to expanding its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile program, especially the ending of Gaddafi in 2011. I mean, you know, Gaddafi came out and said, okay, look, guys, we're going to have going to put our weapons of mass destruction aside. We're going to have international peace and I'm going to still survive as the autocrat of Libya. Well, he did for a little while. He kicked the can down the road just a little bit. And then all of a sudden he got, shafted literally and metaphorically at the end of things. Do you think this is also that kind of calculation in Pyongyang where they say, we can't trust the Americans. Look what happened in Libya. And yeah, Gaddafi was crazy and maybe Kim is crazy, but hey, look, you know, in the end, uh, bad things can happen as a consequence of walking down a trap that the Americans are setting for us. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I just want to say at the outset, I don't think it's productive to have this conversation about whether or not leaders are crazy or not crazy. We can think of them as rational, even if their goals and the information that they get is really different than the goals and information we might want them to get or that leaders that we might respect more get. That's very polite, North Laura. Korea Laura. Has, <laughs> but, but North Korea has goals, right? They want to sustain the regime. They want to keep the regime alive. They want to protect the, the population at some level. And their actions in international politics aren't random or insane. They're calculated to try to make those things possible. And so when we treat them as these rational actors, maybe rational, you know, with some bounds on it, then I think we can understand more why they do what we do. And that's really important for developing strategy. Um, but I do think that it's notable that trust is an issue here. Um, and there's sort of two dynamics of trust. One is, does North Korea think that the United States leadership is consistent, that it will stick by what it says, that it is able and willing to make commitments? And on some level, the U.S. has done relatively well at this. Its foreign policy towards North Korea has had some amount of consistency across different presidential regimes. The goals and messaging has remained relatively clear. But of course, there's always a danger that those goals change over time and that the United States has its own interests in mind. And those interests are very clearly in conflict with North Korea's. The other element of trust and one that is bigger and more intractable is what we might call in political science a commitment problem. Essentially, you can make a commitment now, but you have all of these incentives to roll back that commitment in the future. And we can think of that framework for understanding what happened in Libya. The um, demilitarization of Gaddafi's regime is a compromise, and, and the Western states that are involved essentially ask for that and get what they want. But they're still left with a weaker regime with a very violent, difficult leader who's creating these big international problems, as well as oppressing people at home. And in that second stage of the crisis, when that's the situation, the incentives are now very strongly to intervene and prevent that violence from happening. And of course, that becomes easier when the leader has weaker military capabilities. So that earlier arrangement, which might have looked good for everyone, a promise to allow Libya to continue, but at the same time to let um, 
these intervening powers accomplish their demilitarization goals. That looks good, but only for the short term. And North Korea watches that engagement and U.S. behavior elsewhere in the world and understands that lesson. If they give up their capabilities, even if it's in exchange for something really meaningful, like lifting sanctions or a large amount of food aid, that is a short-term benefit. And the regime in the future is going to have to face adversaries that really do not want North Korea to continue with its current politics and it won't have the military capabilities necessary to protect itself. So even if there was this vast amount of diplomatic trust between North Korean leadership and the American leadership or leadership elsewhere in the world, it just doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you can't design a deal that will protect the North Korean leadership in the long term and get rid of its military capabilities. That's how we end up stuck in this situation. North Korea has to protect those assets if it's going to survive. And that leaves it with very little room to negotiate when it tries to engage in international politics and tries to gain extractions. It just doesn't have any give. You know, in your article, you also uh, elaborated on the sort of capabilities that the North Koreans have been playing around with. And uh, I have to say that uh, now that they, uh, they've got ballistic missiles that can reach the continental United States, what do you think the future holds in terms of a crisis not being able to, dare I say, step back from the brink? Because now the North Koreans, in a moment of peak, for instance, and I'm here I am being very... Um, diplomatic, but in a moment of peak, you know, someone pushes a button in Pyongyang. I mean, that's a res that that'll be not only a regime change in North Korea; it will be a total regime destruction, I would imagine, because even uh, that would be when the Americans will find their might. They will not sit back and just let their cities be nuked by a, a state like North Korea. I would imagine. Certainly, U.S. military power, both conventional and nuclear power in this context, are very influential. The U.S. might have a hard time getting what it wants once a crisis has started to emerge, but it does have deterrent capabilities. There's lots of things that North Korea might be willing to do if it didn't think that there would be military consequences. Mm. And so having the capability to back up threats that say, don't engage in provocations, don't cross the border, don't reignite conflict. Those have to have military backing. The capabilities that North Korea is developing target the U.S. as part of a, a broader strategic reasoning. The goal for North Korea is to decouple the United States from its allies, to make it look like the U.S. wouldn't be willing to endure the costs of a nuclear conflict with North Korea, so maybe North Korea can fight with South Korea or can fight with Japan and yeah. not have the United States get involved. And this dynamic is why it's so important for the United States to focus on alliance, interoperability, and communication with our partners. The new developments with increased trilateral communication are a very powerful deterrent because it communicates to North Korea that their main objective of trying to separate these states and be able to fight them one by one is not going to work. And that instead, the alliance is strong and continues to develop in ways that demonstrate that North Korea's military capabilities are not going to be enough to win if an actual war happens. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that North Korea is going to back down all the way. They're not going to necessarily stop missile testing or stop developing their capabilities. But there's a lot of forces at play that are keeping a war from happening. And those include both military, physical military capabilities, which the United States um, has much more advanced um, and much more um, options than the North Korean military. Um, but also there's a softer side of that dynamic, which is about maintaining and strengthening U.S. alliances in the Indo-Pacific. You know, we hear a lot about, well, I mean, we still hear a lot about the notion of North Korea being part of an axis of evil, or at least an axis of, well, you know, ne'er-do-wells. But the fact of the matter is, um, you know, if we end up uh, suggesting that this is the case, how then does something like mutually assured destruction as a concept come about? I mean, does MAD, mutually assured destruction by its acronym, how does MAD apply to the US-North Korea relationship? And does it at all influence North Korean behavior? Because I mean, we've we've just skirted on that, but can we dig a little bit deeper on it? It's, it's a fascinating area. Yeah. So 
I think there, there are a couple different dynamics here. One is how does mutually assured destruction work? And mm. we can think of mutually assured destruction as essentially a game of chicken. You have two cars that are driving at each other and whichever car swerves first loses the game, mm. right? Now, if you have two cars of equal size that are going at each other, then it's hard to know who's going to win. In the US North Korea context, the story has always been well, one car is so much bigger than the other car. And so the little car, the North Koreans are going to swerve first. But the dynamics are actually a lot more complicated. It's not just how big your capabilities are, but how intensely committed you are to winning the game. And what we've often seen with North Korea is that North Korea comes out repeatedly and says, we're willing to crash the car. We're very mm -hmm. committed to winning. And so mm -hmm. that element of resolve gives them that advantage, even when they have weaker capabilities. But at the same time, no one really wants the cars to crash. And if North Korea's primary goal is to protect the leadership and perhaps to protect the sovereignty of the country as well, then they don't have any reason to engage in the suicidal strategy of crashing the car until they're absolutely pressed into a corner where there is truly no alternative. And we're not in that version of the world. We're not in that version of the world because both states are able to communicate to each other that any sort of escalation is going to be really, really consequential for both nations. Um, so when we talk about North Korea as part of an axis of evil, then we're adding on this additional dynamic where maybe North Korea isn't acting alone. And this is where we start to get these worries about North Korean um, engagement with China or the potential new arms deal with Russia. What happens if North Korea gets these added capabilities that come from allies, or if a conflict becomes a conflict between North Korea and allies versus the United States and its allies. In those dynamics, the game starts to look different and more complicated. Now, again, I would say I don't think we're at that stage yet, but this packaging of North Korea as part of this broader alliance of ne'er-do-wells, as you say, brings up these issues about what the future of North Korean politics will look like and what that might mean for broader strategy in the region. Lauren, do you think that as North Korea strengthens its you know, military capabilities, that it becomes a bit of an asset for countries like China and Russia who are trying to you know, create their own space in the Indo-Pacific? Um, people have said uh, for quite some years now that there is always that possibility that North Korea slips streams into a sort of little... Um, uh, attack dog of China or an attack dog of Russia, you know, I always found that being at odds with reality, uh, the North Koreans and the Chinese have a very prickly relationship, but I think pragmatism has something to say about this as well. The Chinese are finding things very difficult at the moment internally. Um, I'm not so sure whether or not they will have the capacity nor even the will to push back the Americans over the Taiwan Straits. But you know, by injecting just a little bit of anger in Pyongyang and directing them to go off and do some scary stuff, perhaps would be enough for the Chinese to gain strategically if they were to play that game. Would you would you agree with that? Or do you think that that's not on the cards at all because of that intercultural, interpolitical issue that the Chinese and North Koreans have? I wouldn't describe North Korea as an attack dog as much as a liability. Neither China nor Russia at this point want to be fighting wars in the Indo-Pacific. And if North Korea starts one and they're drawn in, that's not good for either country. And so, mm. yes, re relations are warming, and this is something that we should be concerned about. But Chinese leadership and Russian leadership have very strong incentives to make sure that there is a cap on North Korean behavior, that they don't get drawn in to a massive and potentially nuclear war. So when we've seen cooperation between the United States, Russia, China on issues of North Korea in the past, it's boiled down to this issue. China wants to have stability on its border more than anything else. They might think that that stability comes from allowing the North Korean regime to stay in place and play its cards and keep that contained, but they don't want a conflagration on a major scale. 
and the same dynamics are true for Russia, they might not mind North Korean missile testing being a distraction to U.S. interests at the moment. But if that started to escalate into a conflict, then Russia has a real problem with whether or not they can really start engaging in anything bigger than the disastrous war that they're currently engaged in. Um, when we start to talk about Taiwan, that might be a different scenario. There are possibilities that if there were actually a conflict over Taiwan, North Korea might be involved or be a complicating factor in some way. Um, but up until we get to that point, most of the incentives for Russia and Chinese leadership are actually to try to calm down the activity in Pyongyang rather than dial it up. They can gain other benefits from the alliance. If Putin, mm -hmm. for example, gets massive amounts of artillery from North Korea, artillery that was given to them in the Korean War, um, that's a concrete benefit for the regime. But that's not encouraging North Korea to act as an attack dog. That's getting minor military economic benefits from a relatively tenuous ally. Mm -hmm. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. And from the UK, we're speaking with assistant professor at the LSE, Lauren Sukin, on her recent article in the Bulletin for the Atomic Scientists, Bigger Isn't Always Better, Why the United States Fails to Deter North Korea Despite Nuclear Superiority. Lauren, you mentioned in your article asymmetric crises. Could you clarify what these are and how they differ from symmetric crises in the context of nuclear deterrence? So when we talk about symmetric or asymmetric nuclear crises, what we're really talking about is the balance of capabilities between the two states that might be engaged in a contest. And now we're simplifying it down to two, um, but often these, these involve additional alliance dynamics. The sort of classic story that we get told about nuclear weapons and how nuclear weapons work is a story of mutually assured destruction, where the United States and the Soviet Union have similar capabilities. They could both destroy the world several times over. And because of that, they don't fight what we might call hot wars. They don't send their forces to fight each other. Instead, they fight a cold war where they engage in smaller conflicts involving proxy groups elsewhere in the world. And mutually assured destruction or having similar capabilities is what allows that to happen. The states know that if they fought a nuclear war, that would be the end of everything to be dramatic. And so they have to find other ways for the contestation between them to manifest. Now, a critical assumption in that logic is that both states have similar capabilities. In fact, many of the nuclear crises that we've seen throughout history actually occur between states whose nuclear capabilities look quite different from each other. If we think about crises that involve, for example, Israel, as well as the Soviet Union and its allies, or we think about crises between the United States and North Korea, or we think about French or UK capabilities to deter Russia or the Soviet Union, these are asymmetric dynamics. One or more than one of the partners is relatively relatively weak compared to the other side. So the key assumption in that initial argument about mutually assured destruction, that it's all about what would happen if you fought out the war to its end yeah. point, that looks really different when you have a weak state fighting a much bigger state. So the key insight into in the research that backs the article in the bulletin that we're talking about today is research that looks at symmetric and asymmetric crises differently and says there have to be different stories at work here. One is a story of mutually assured destruction, we might call general deterrence, where you can't threaten the other side, and so you have to fight over these peripheral issues. And in the asymmetric element, you have immediate deterrence instead, which is a kind of deterrence where you can keep a conflict from becoming a nuclear war, but you can't uh, prevent conflicts from emerging over really core interests. And so if we think about the difference between the U.S.-Soviet Union crises, these sort of peripheral crises, and the U.S.-North Korea crises, these crises are usually about essentially the future of the North Korean regime or the existence of the state or the stability of the regime, these things that are really critical. Whereas in that symmetric dynamic, the U.S. can't credibly threaten to start nuking Moscow in quite the same way that that credibility does exist in the asymmetric metric side. So why do we care about this? Why does it matter that the crisis dynamics look different in symmetric and asymmetric cases? Well, the key insight is that in asymmetric cases, it ends up not being determined 
by capabilities, but instead capabilities create this problem of resolve where the stronger state um, is able to create a crisis over a really critical issue, but the state that's sort of cornered that either has to give up something essential or has to fight an insanely costly nuclear war, they have to roar back as strong as they can. And that gives them the extra edge that might allow them to get out of these sticky situations. So it means that even though you could have a really big military, you could have tons, thousands of nuclear weapons, you can't always get what you want in international politics with that alone. And of course, we know that nuclear politics are far more complicated than what weapons you have in the basement. It often comes down to posture, to signaling, to alliance dynamics, all of these sort of supplementary elements that are about communicating how willing you really would be to fight a war. Lauren, are there any potential diplomatic or strategic approaches that the United States could consider to improving its ability to deter North Korea's nuclear and missile activities? I mean, for instance, did Trump's outreach to Pyongyang achieve anything other than photo ops? I think there are a lot of diplomatic and other types of policies that the United States can use to strengthen deterrence. Um, but we have to sort of separate the deterrence dynamic from the arms control dynamic. That is one of the questions here is, how do you prevent North Korean aggression? And how do you make sure that if North Korea does act aggressively, that they don't um, get what they want in that dynamic? And the other side is, can we denuclearize North Korea? Can we make the world safer by trying to come to some sort of agreement on their capabilities? Um, I'll talk about the arms control side first. I am relatively pessimistic that true denuclearization of North Korea is possible. Now, of course, denuclearization is the objective of U.S. foreign policy, and there continue to be strong efforts to make that happen. But if North Korea were to give up its nuclear weapons, it gives up its only method of protecting its regime. I don't see a straightforward way to resolve that. But there are other things that could be done. There are ways that the North Korean nuclear arsenal could be safer. There could be more transparency. There could be a freeze on additional developments in their nuclear delivery capabilities or their actual stockpile of weapons. And we might be able to get some leverage on those issues because at this point, North Korea already has an arsenal that does what it needs to do, provide a survival capability for the regime. So I think there are, there are some areas where the U.S. can push on arms control, but we need to understand on some level that complete denuclearization is not something that's likely to happen, certainly not in the short term. On the other hand, we have these issues of deterrence and war fighting. And there, I think the critical issue is about building up strength within the alliances of continuing to develop crisis communications with South Korea and North Korea, to engage in planning with these states, to engage in military exercises, to respond collectively when North Korea does uh, provoke its adversaries in the region. And I think an important dynamic for building up that alliance capability is to recognize that we don't need nuclear weapons to respond to nuclear threats in every instance, that it's also a question of conventional capabilities, of having precision strike capabilities that can hold at risk key North Korean assets, or building up um, comprehensive uh, interoperability between forces uh, that each of these allies have that would need to be able to fight together if a conflict actually broke out. And so making sure that this just it doesn't just become an issue of nuclear planning, but also really integrates and recognizes the importance of conventional weapons in this process, I think that can show alliance cohesiveness and also tamp down the temperature of some of these conflicts by making it clear that nuclear escalation is not beneficial to anyone. You know, it, it takes two to tango, Lauren. And in your uh, in your research, do you think that Kim Jong Un or any of his successors would be open to denuclearization? I mean, it it seems a far fetched proposition. I mean, it's great that we we can try to aim for it. it it's a lofty amb ambition of sorts. But can we actually get to that end point? Because you know, if the other side isn't willing to sort of see things from our perspective, because they're really into regime survival mode, and that's the only thing that they're seeing. 
um, how does one get to change your adversary's mind on these issues? I mean, this is a critical uh, uh, state of play, and I'm not sure whether uh, the people in Washington, D.C. would really know how to try to in entice um, Pyongyang with anything, really, because it goes back to what we were saying earlier about trust and the whole, you know, potential repeat of the Gaddafi episode in North Korea. The challenge here is communicating to North Korea that they don't need nuclear weapons to remain stable and remain in power. It may not be possible to do that in today's political environment, but there are things the U.S. can do to try to ease that communication. Not formally adopting a policy of regime change is an important consistency to maintain. The U.S. can also try to communicate that it is not reliant necessarily on nuclear deterrence in East Asia, but that conventional weapons are a much more important part of its military strategy. Engaging in arms control in other places, for example, with Russia or with China, can help demonstrate that these states are willing to give up nuclear capabilities, that they don't need um, extremely large nuclear arsenals in order to maintain their political goals. All of those policies help convey the message that nuclear weapons are not necessarily the strategic end-all be-all. Um, on top of that, though, the United States might have to think about other ways to tacitly learn to live with a North Korean nuclear program. Now, formal acceptance of the program would, of course, have consequences, could communicate to other would-be nuclear states that the costs of nuclear proliferation are lower than they might anticipate, could create alliance problems with states that are quite worried about North Korean nuclear capabilities. But at the same time, there are I do have some colleagues in the field who have argued that due to the intractability of the North Korean nuclear problem, perhaps that's something the United States should accept and instead try to work on other issues like how to develop nuclear safeguards for the North Korean arsenal. This remains a major debate in the literature between those who think it's very important to convey to North Korea that their nuclear status is unacceptable in order to um, make sure that other states don't go down North Korea's path, and those who think that this is an issue that has gone too far, that North Korea is not going to roll back its nuclear program. Um, there are some good arguments on, on both sides, and what I take away from that debate is that we need to find a way to do both, to show that there are ways that we can cooperate areas where we can work with North Korea to try to make their arsenal safer or smaller and things that we can um, provide to North Korea to make that happen. But at the same time that we will continue to strengthen um, our, our alliances in the region and continue to build up conventional forces uh, while sort of de-emphasizing some of the nuclear elements of, of strategy in the Indo-Pacific. So how do you view Japan and South Korea's role as potential constraints on American actions against North Korea? It would be a mistake to suggest that just because Japan and South Korea are American allies, they are always in sync with Washington. And we do know from recent history that Japan and South Korea themselves have kind of had quite a little bit of friction along along the road. So, uh, you know, it, that makes things very difficult for the Americans. The Americans need to have Japan and South Korea working together. And if the, those two allies don't want to see eye to eye in a lot of things, it could end up complicating a, a whole mess of stuff with regard to North Korea, I would imagine. Absolutely. It's not just that the United States needs to find ways to identify joint goals between South Korea and Japan, but it also needs to make sure that it's on the same page in those bilateral alliances. There are differences between U.S. and South Korean policy towards North Korea, and there are differences between the United States and Japan on how strongly to commit to Taiwan or how important certain threats are from China. Um, the important thing is that the United States continues to work with those allies and smooth communication so that we understand what those allies want and can develop policies that um, meet the midpoint between everyone's strategic interests. South Korea and Japan have a long history of tensions, and there's been significant uh, reluctance over the years to engage in trilateral communications or exercises or military planning. Um, as the United States has continued to push for cooperation in that dynamic, um, and as the, the current 
um, political dynamics in South Korea and Japan ha have softened a bit towards each other, then we've seen more coordination. But that's not to say that these states work in, in perfect step with each other or that we can get some sort of uh, true NATO-like alliance in East Asia in, in the short uh, term, but that these are good steps in the right direction and that a uh, true alliance has to recognize those differences of opinion and work through them rather than just trying to force allies to a table and get them all to agree to what the U.S. would ideally want to do. It has to be a true equal partnership that recognizes the very serious threats that uh, South Korea and Japan and other U.S. allies in the region face, not just from North Korea, but also from China. Um, one of the things that um, uh, concerns me slightly is the direction the United States is actually heading. You know, some of the uh, U.S. presidential candidates uh, seem to be flirting very much with the idea of a almost neo-isolationist approach in terms of foreign policy and strategic policy. How do you think this is going to either help or hinder Washington's policy options regarding North Korea? I mean, say, for instance, we get a second Trump presidency or, or God forbid, you know, um, RFK Jr., you know, becomes the nominee for, for the Democrats. You know, both of them are touting the same sort of isolationist American foreign policy. That's That's going to really complicate things enormously, won't it? The United States has a major role in making sure that the world is safe. It does not always do that in a perfect way, but it fills a really important um, role in global politics. And a U.S. that retrenches or becomes isolationist causes myriad unthinkable problems across the world. So yeah. we should be really concerned if the United States does end up with an extremely isolationist president. Um, at the same time, fortunately, there are a number of forces in American politics that act as a check against those potentially worst impulses of a potential presidential candidate. Um, Trump went into office, you know, on his campaign trail talking about how South Korea and Japan and other U.S. allies should uh, have their own nuclear weapons and really pressed for burden sharing, saying the U.S. was going to pull out of NATO and everyone needed to pay their fair share. And those are not things that came to pass, in part because Trump was one actor in a much bigger political system full of very um, excellent qualified professionals in the State Department and the military who recognized that these ideas would be disastrous and were able um, to communicate to U.S. allies and adversaries around the world that the U.S. remained committed to its alliances and remained committed to ensuring that there was peace. Now, at the same time, if I were sitting in the capital of a U.S. ally and watching an election happen, I might start to be concerned about how long those checks and balances are going to continue to work the same way that they have worked in the past. And I think what that means is that a lot of the work that the Biden administration is doing to strengthen these alliances needs to be sustainable. It needs to create, for example, continuous communication between the U.S. military and militaries of adversaries. It needs to have embedded diplomatic officials that are not just going to get pulled back very quickly if there's a political change. And to its credit, I think this is what the Biden administration is doing, is planning for um, a world in which we need to have these really deeply embedded bureaucratic structures and mechanisms that allow alliances to continue to move forward and allows credibility to be maintained, even if there is some sort of unfortunate political outcome in U.S. elections. Okay, Lauren, finally, looking ahead, what are the potential implications for regional and global security if the U.S. continues to struggle with deterring North Korea's nuclear ambitions? North Korea is likely at this point to continue to develop its nuclear arsenal. Um, there's no signs that they are, for example, planning to stop the development of their missile capabilities or reverse the size of their arsenal. And as North Korea's nuclear arsenal gets more powerful, that also gives it um, a greater ability to threaten the United States and U.S. partners around the world. Um, the more nuclear capabilities North Korea has, the more destruction it could cause if a conflict happened. And so there are good reasons for 
um, the United States and its allies to be quite worried about these developments. Um, that means that the U.S. can't rely necessarily on politics as usual, but needs to start thinking strategically about what it can do to make sure that threats from North Korea do not get worse. And some of those policies that we talked about earlier could be part of that dynamic. Um, the U.S. also has a lot of different threats around the world to deal with, and the policies that it chooses to engage with with North Korea are going to be observed by U.S. adversaries and allies and um, other states across the world. So if the U.S., for example, stops responding to provocations from from Pyongyang, then what message does that communicate to other states in the world that may want to act similarly uh, with aggression? Or on the other hand, if the U.S. adopts a regime change policy and transparently says, we want to get this regime out of power, what does that communicate to other regimes where the U.S. has less friendly relationships? And so part of the impetus who are really focusing on this issue is making sure that threats from Pyongyang don't get worse. But it's also about the United States's um, larger nuclear policies and being able to communicate messages around non-proliferation to the rest of the world. Lauren, thanks for joining us and for sharing your insights on The Focus. Thank you for having me. I was happy to be here. Thank you. And to our audience, thanks for tuning into the Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find the Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages, and on the platform formerly known as Twitter, now X, or on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the Media Center drop-down menu and hitting Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. My thanks to our stalwart production team of Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart, and to the team at the Ozcast Network. Join us again next time as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni, and from Adelaide, South Australia, You've been listening to The Focus.